Well, I began a message last week on the key to receiving the Father's promises for us. And um, it, it's an interesting thought as you look through the scriptures that the Father himself has made certain promises to us. And uh, he'd like to fulfill them in our lives. But there are keys to receiving these promises. There are many, many promises in the scripture. In fact, the vast majority of them, they're actually conditional. God himself has committed himself to us to do certain things for us and with us, through us. And, uh, and, and some of those he just does. But the vast majority of them actually require our participation, our agreement, our positioning of ourselves with faith and in hunger for him. See, when he makes promises to us, he, he's looking for people who actually want him. Because if you don't want him, you're not really all that interested in his promises because all of his promises ultimately bring, when they are fulfilled, they actually bring you closer to him, make you more like him, and, and you accomplish his purposes in the earth. And so God is, uh, in his wisdom, has actually made many of these promises conditional. Some people make the mistake of thinking, well, God promised it and I can just claim it. Well, there's, there are promises to claim by faith, but there are many that where God says, if you will just do this, I will do this for you. And kids, we're going to release you out of the room right now. <laughs> we forgot. There go some promises right there. <laughs> Thank you. So I, it's important for you to understand. God says, if this is my heart, this is my desire, that these, this is my commitment to you, I'm absolute, absolutely going to do this, but I'm looking at you and what's in your heart to see what you're going to do. And he deliberately makes it conditional because... He wants the things that he does for us to happen in covenant relationship. God is looking for relationship. God is a lover looking for lovers. He's not interested in being your personal vending machine. And some people treat God that way. But he's, he's looking that every time that we reach up to receive something from him, to touch him, we actually become like him. Something changes inside of us. And so uh, I think God uh, was very smart in doing that because I've lived long enough to realize how selfish we are and how self-centered we can be. And, 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 uh, um, and how we can you know, move around him instead of toward him. So we, we began by looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And I want to have you go ahead and turn there again with me. If you got your Bible. Hope you're starting to bring your Bible more and more. And I really believe that um, what I'm going to share with you today really is one of the major words for the church in the future. In fact, I, uh, the other night I uh, walked into to our bedroom and Margie had God TV on. And I stopped to focus for a moment, and I realized this guy's preaching my message from this Sunday. He, he had this passage that he, that he just brought my message. And I went, wow, okay, thank you for the confirmation, Lord. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's just very quickly review this passage. Some of you weren't here last week, and so you need to, you need to hear this word of God anyway. So we're going to start with... Uh, Chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. 
Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And working together with him, we also urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Then Paul makes a couple of personal comments to them, but it comes back to this theme in verse 14 in chapter 6. <clears throat> so do not be bound together with unbelievers. So what he's, what he's doing now is he's about to tell us how we can receive the grace of God in vain. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with the idols? For we are all the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and, I, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch which is unclean, and I will welcome you. And I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. And in one final verse, chapter 7, verse 1, Therefore, Paul says, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Now, that's not a suggestion from Paul. That's actually a commandment from him. Therefore, having these promises, pray that God will change you. Is that what he said? Having these promises, let us, let us. Okay, the ball just went into our court, didn't it? It just came from his court. Having these promises comes into our court now. Let us cleanse ourselves from a few things. Let us cleanse ourselves from every single thing that contaminates, that defiles, That actually pollutes. The word actually means pollute. Pollutes our body. Can pollute our spirit. Let us cleanse ourselves from those things. Perfecting, and this is what we're really doing. We're perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. Suggestion or command. This is really... This is an apostolic command from the Apostle Paul saying, God has done this, he's made these promises, but we must respond this way in order for those promises to take effect in our lives. There's something that God is looking for so that his, those promises can actually land and flourish in our lives. So it's extremely important that uh, and personally, I believe this is one of the most important verses in the New Testament. Let us cleanse ourselves. Let us perfect holiness in the fear of the Lord. So I've spent a number of years camping out on this verse, this passage, and um, just meditating and processing and saying, God, what do you mean by that? And, and um, and I realize God's been speaking to me, and he's been saying, I am absolutely dead serious about this. Don't miss this. This is not a suggestion. This is not something, you know, if you feel up to it or uh, if, you, if you decide that you really want to become spiritual, um, that this, this is absolutely critical. 
It's something that God is looking for in us. He's actually watching. He's watching to see what we're going to do. Because whenever God places something in our hands that is him and it has possibility, he's always looking to see what we're going to do. How am I going to respond to what he's given me? How am I going to respond to what he's called me to? What do I do with heavenly things that are being offered to me in the person of who he is? When he draws near to me to do things for me that I cannot do for myself, what is my response to that? How will I handle it? Will it be valuable to me? Will I turn myself inside out so that I can make sure that those things happen in my life? So very quickly, we looked last week at the promises, and I'll just touch on them. You, you can look at the message online to get, to get the full message. But he said, here's the promises. I will dwell in them. This is the Father's desire. This is his promise. I will come and I will dwell in them. I will walk among them. Now, is, are, is that an experiential thing or is that just an idea? No, it's an experiential thing. God created you and I to, to, in fact, he was looking for, and this is one of the reasons that he sent Jesus, he has been always waiting for a place to dwell, people to dwell. He's not looking for a building. He's looking for people. I want to dwell in them. All the Old Testament, prophets spoke of this many times, that where God was looking forward to a people in whom he would dwell. And if you just stop and think about it, God dwelling in me. Wow. And he would walk among a group of people in whom he was dwelling. What does that look like? We need to show the world what it looks like when God walks among people. This is the promise of the Father. This is the desire of the Father to walk among us. And he said, I will be their God. I'm going to be the one who is the power source, the power base in your life. I will take responsibility for you in all that you need. Do for you what you cannot do for yourself. I will be your God. You won't need anything else. I'll be, I will be the sufficiency of your life. And you will be my people. I'm going to bring you into a covenant relationship with me where I identify you from my heart as those whom I love and have chosen, you will be my people. And therefore, my inheritance, my blessing, my favor will come and rest upon you. And you will see it actively being released through your circumstances in ways that you could never make happen. You will be my people. And, and the world will be able to see. See, God is actually wanting to demonstrate who he is through his people in the way that he treats them, in the way that with, he walks among them and they respond to him and they receive what he has. You and I were meant to be carriers of heaven. We were meant to be those who uh, are walking in the promises, to, to be those who are experiencing dimensions of heavenly possibility on our lives that the world cannot touch. God would like to provoke some people to jealousy through your life. In fact, uh, when God's favor is really working on your life and through your life, a lot of people are jealous of you. Because you're receiving things that they can't touch. Why do you get that? Why is that happening? And so forth. And uh, the blessings of heaven that, you know, that God said, I want to open up the windows of heaven and pour out more than you can contain. One of the things that he did with Christ when he brought us into Christ and, and we were washed and redeemed is that, and he set us up in, in heavenly places with Jesus was to bless us now with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. But who may ascend the hill of the Lord and who may stand in that holy place? He who has clean hands, pure heart. You know what? That has never changed just because that's, David saying that in the Old Testament, Psalm 24, doesn't mean that God has changed the way he does things. A lot of people think that, oh, no, I'm just, I've, been, I've been forgiven, I've been cleansed, the grace of God is on me, so 
it doesn't matter whether I have clean hands and a pure heart. Not so. If it didn't matter, then Paul wouldn't have been writing all these things. There wouldn't be a call for us to be holy as he is holy. To actively participate with the Holy Spirit in the perfection of, of being like the Lord. So these are his promises as listed that Paul lists. I'm going to dwell in them, walk among them, I'm going to be their God, they're going to be my people. And did you know that this is actually what the goal of God's grace? This is the goal of being a new creation. Is so that God could actually dwell in us. He couldn't, he couldn't dwell in, in the Old Testament. God is not dwelling in people. He shows up occasionally and rests upon them. But he was looking for people that he could actually dwell in. And so he did this work of grace, which was to cause us to become a new creation so that we now have the capacity to host God. Mm. And when you're hosting God, all the God possibilities can now flow through you. And when, you're, when you are hosting God as the temple of the Holy Spirit, that when, when we come together as the church, and we don't forsake the assembling of ourselves, as is the custom of some, Hebrews. <laughs> but we come together, and, in we, and we are in covenant relationship with one another, maintaining and pursuing the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, God is able to come and do something in our midst, walking among us, to reveal himself in a way that he can't reveal himself just through your life. There is a whole dimension of the world experiencing the kingdom of God and who he is when we come together and let him walk among us. Mm -hmm. And part of holiness is learning how we treat one another, how we regard one another, how we let love flow is the as the perfect bond of peace among us so god's got a passion he's got a desire he, i want to dwell in i want to walk among i'm going to have a people i'm going to be their god and 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 the picture that we get from from the scriptures is that god is actually very excited about that he's been dreaming about this from the from the moment he he created the universe and the earth and he put adam and eve and, and breathed the breath of life in them it was all about being able to have a people and be their God. But because Adam and Eve sinned, they destroyed the possibility of, of, the, of these promises happening, the dwelling in and the walking among. And so he solved the problem by sending Jesus to become one in whom he could dwell in by his spirit because he was sinless and then through the offering up of himself and having walked in perfect relationship with the Father, we now can enter in. He who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. In other words, you and I get set up now to be just like Jesus in the presence of the Father. We don't deserve it. We don't qualify at all. Jesus qualified and so his substitutionary death on our behalf made all this possible. Wow. You know, the day that you actually take that seriously and get excited about that and start dreaming about all the possibilities that can flow through your life because of that, it'll just mess you up. You just start, you're going to start running in new directions. So you, uh, it's a lot of people just, yeah, oh, yeah, I want to be a new creation so I can go to heaven. No, he made you a new creation so what, he could dwell in you in the earth. He already placed you in the heavens through the new birth. But is, there's a goal that he has for what he wants to do with us here in the earth. Okay, so he, he made us a new creation, and all of that happened through grace so that these new creations that are walking around as sons and daughters on the earth now can be those for whom these promises are fulfilled. And, there's, and I hear the cry of heaven for the sons and daughters of God to be revealed in the earth. 
I'm hearing the cry of heaven, the passion of heaven, like never before in my spirit. Sometimes it just messes me up. I just start crying. And, but it's the Father's great desire to be seen in the earth through his children. Because there's a quality of something that happens, something that's very evident, very demonstrable, manifested through those who realize I'm a new creation with a purpose of him dwelling in me. I now, I now am that righteousness of God. I now am the, become this temple of the Holy Spirit. I now have been made a son and daughter, adopted in the family. And now being in the family, watch me run. Watch me live in the earth. Watch me live in response to who he is and as a reflection of him. God does not want to be hidden. He wants to be seen. But he's chosen to be seen and operative through his people. He could easily just show up. I mean, he didn't need it. He could have angels just show up all over the place and just start throwing heavenly bowling balls everywhere and, and just start making everything go according to what he wants. But he's chosen to be a family man. He's a father who wants children, and he wants for this inheritance to flow down from him to his children and watch what they do with it in the earth to reveal himself. So there are these promises. And we looked at how he, all that he did in order to set us up so these promises could happen. He made us the temple. He brought us into the light out of the darkness. Aren't you glad? So what, what do people who have been brought out of darkness, what, what do they look like? What do they act like? How, how do they function? I mean, think about it. So I, I've become convinced that there are a whole lot of Christians walking around that light and dark has never even entered into their mind. They, quote, got saved because they prayed a sinner's prayer, but they never experienced coming out of darkness. They've, they never under, they've never understood. I was, I was taken out of my, my, uh, my bondage to the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of Satan, and I was transferred in my citizenship into the kingdom of God, the kingdom of light, the kingdom of his son whom he loves. And something has changed. My citizenship has changed. I am a new, never before seen, never before experienced in the earth creation of heaven. And we need to learn to start thinking that way, functioning that way, expecting something amazing that we've never seen coming through our lives. Okay. If it's just little old you, you don't have much to expect, do you? <laughs> but if you're a new creation in him, oh, wow. Okay, let's start talking it up big here. So these are conditional promises based on how we treat this relationship. Now, the Scripture tells us, in, 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 this is in the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20. God says that he's a jealous God. Now, he's all into, he's into the relationship. And you and I can understand a lot of how he feels and how, how he responds to us from the relationships that we have, especially the, the most precious ones like marriage. But this is what he said in Exodus 20. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Oh, he's telling us something very specific about himself. He's saying, if you're going to have a relationship with me and I'm going to be your God and you're going to be my people, let me make it very clear to you. I get very disturbed. I get provoked inside. I, I am jealous when there's competition. 
when I see your heart being distracted and moving towards another power source in your life, when you start believing that somebody else is going to be able to bless you better than me, when you start putting your trust in something else, you, you start bowing down your time, energy, and resource, your attentions, your affections towards something that's not me, it bothers me. And I actually get jealous. He's, used, he's the one who used the word jealous. I'm a jealous God. So he calls us in this holy relationship that he's, if I'm going to be your God, you need to understand. I'm not fickle with you. I don't back away from you. I'm committed all the way. I love you with an unconditional love, an unwavering commitment. You're that valuable to me. I want to be that valuable to you. I'm looking for a reciprocal response. Now, here's the thing is that no one can love God that way except God. That's why he had to make us a new creation. He had to put us into Christ because Jesus was the one who came in human flesh and loved God that way. He had no other lovers. He had no other, nothing else that he was interested in except the Father. Aren't you glad to get qualified to be able to offer up himself as a sacrifice on our behalf? So when we say that he was perfectly sinless, we like to say, well, he didn't do any wrong things. He didn't break any laws. But actually, he was sinless in that his heart was in perfect relationship with the Father. His heart was an absolute commitment and love for the Father, and he wanted nothing else. Do you think God's still looking for that today? Is he still looking that for, for that amongst his people? That he would find somebody who wants nothing else other than to be with him and to be like him? That we are so fascinated, so enamored with who he is that we cry out, holy is the Lord. There's no one like you, Lord. No one can even come close to who you are. You are so otherly different that all the things that we've looked at at the earth that we've been f impressed with lord um, we look at you and we go whoa wow and it changes us changes our desire changes our heart we realize he's everything it all begins with him it all ends with him in fact, to look anywhere else would just be plain foolish. It would just be plain stupid, acting to our own detriment to move away from him. Well, Jesus saw that. He lived it. He went through the cross to the grave, was raised again through the glory of the Father so that you and I through grace, putting our faith in him, could come into Christ, become this new creation, so that now we have the potential of loving God because we, are now, we now have God in us. We now have his nature in us. We now have the spirit of God. See, you, you become the temple of the Holy Spirit so that that level of love and worship can flow through you back to heaven. Maybe you didn't know that about yourself. Maybe you didn't know that when you prayed that prayer to receive Jesus, whenever it was, that God was setting you up to be this kind of living lover on the earth. I don't want to make God jealous. How about you? I don't want him to look at my life and say, oh, there he goes again. He's chasing after. You know, when you look at, you look at our marriage vows, what, what, what do we vow? But what is one of the number one things central to the marriage vows? I 
I promise to commit myself to you alone, forsaking all others. And how many of you know that if that wasn't in the commitment of the marriage, it wouldn't be a marriage? The honeymoon would just be an affair for a while until I want to find somebody else. Shallow relationship, is it? Yeah. But for a man and woman to stand before God and witnesses and to say, I am now promise, I am now committing myself to you alone. I am, I am right here, separating by my will. I am separating myself from. See, marriage isn't just about two people and falling in love wanting to be together. It's about who you're not with as well. You get that? It's not just a piece of paper. The paper is a declaration that two people in front of witnesses separated themselves from everybody else in society to become one with each other and to live as, as a unit, as one flesh for the rest of their lives. By the way, I just read an article this week that scientists have discovered now that a woman can actually carry the very DNA of the man with whom she has had sexual relations with. Adds a little dimension to becoming one flesh. They've actually found in her body the DNA of the man that she was with. Would to God that we would find some God DNA inside of us and because we're, we're busy loving him. That there's that level of transfer that, that's happening in our relationship with him. But I'm telling you, it doesn't really happen until you and I make the decision that I'm going for God alone, forsaking all others. And this is actually what the word holiness means. It means set apart from, set apart unto. But the crux of the word holiness is I am set apart. That means that I am now stepping into a completely different relationship with God that affects all my other relationships. With people, with things, with everything that surrounds me in my life, anything that could compete with the place that God would have in my life, his priorities, values, practices, all of those things, whatever I generate out of my life, whatever motivates me and, and, and drives my heart and so forth, that everything about me is getting set apart from those potential detractors. Those potential, the potential competition, even the very enemies of God. And by the way, have you read in the Bible that God says that anything that pulls you away from me is my enemy? Anyone who does not love God is my enemy. Anyone who is of the world and loves the world and has not set themselves apart unto me actually is my enemy. And so we have this call on our lives as sons and daughters, as, as the very temple of God, having been born again by the Spirit of God. To, to have God dwell in us, and that becomes the number one defining thing about my life. It defines everything. It defines who I am. See, when you get married, you are now Mr. and Mrs., there's even an exchange of names and, and, and other kinds of things. You, you're no longer, and one of the biggest challenges for a lot of new married couples is to stop thinking of singles. They say, oh, yeah, that's right, I'm married. <laughs> I have to consider you. We're together. Our finances, everything, all of our plans, are, and I can't keep thinking about just me and leave you behind. That leads to divorce. 
But we've entered into this covenant relationship that defines who I am, defines where I'm going, defines where I'm going to end up, defines who I'm becoming. So the really healthy marriages are one where the, the two people didn't just become one flesh, they're actually becoming like each other. Even personalities and dreams and, and everything else is getting so blended together. In fact, they, they can say that a lot of people who have been married a long time actually start looking like each other. God would like for us to look like him. He said, I'm a jealous God. I visit the iniquity of the fathers on the children on third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. So I want to say to you this morning that God knows your heart toward him, not just by your display of worship and your giving and, and even sharing your faith with other people. He actually knows your heart toward him by how you relate to those who don't love God and are opposed to him, to those who hate him. Make no mistake, the world hates God. It says it over and over again in the scripture. We don't have time to read those this morning. The world has made itself the enemy of God. Jesus said, the world hates me, and they're going to hate you if you love me and follow me. Because the world is, is trying to live according to the t original temptation in the garden. You can be your own God. You can determine your own destiny, create your own reality. You can be God. The world has not yet come and bowed the knee to God and said, there is no other God except you. And the prince of the power of the air, the prince of this world, is running the entire world according to a system that is at, at odds and opposed to God. And so how you and I relate to the things that are opposed to God, the things that are contrary to him, the things, the things that are substitutionary, the things that contradict the things that challenge who he is and what he said, the things that lead you to a different theology, a different morality, different, a different philosophy. The world is full of antagonism and substitution about the things of God. How you and I relate to the world and to those things actually it is probably one of the greatest demonstrations of where you are in your relationship with him, where your heart is with him. It's one of the greatest demonstrations of whether he really is your God and you are his people and, and you value him dwelling in you. So what I'm saying to you this morning is that what Paul is saying in this passage, he's saying, be sure not to receive the grace of God in vain, is that God sets you and I up in such a way that we can have all of this with him. But if we are playing around with other things, we're actually provoking the jealousy of God and the promises of God of what could happen if he's dwelling in us and walking among us actually don't happen, and the grace of God is in vain in your life. And I said last week that that word in vain actually just means empty vessel. Your life ends up in the long run having become an empty vessel. Nothing to show for having, been come, having become the temple of the Holy Spirit. This is why Paul is urging us, saying, you got to get this right. Now, let me just break a few things down here as we wrap this up. He calls us to cleanse ourselves from all defilement. And I said earlier, this word defilement means, means contamination or pollution. How many of you like the word contamination? Pollution. Our whole culture has come to realize we've become very educated in what contamination and pollution actually produces. There's a lot of concern right now about 
all of the uh, nuclear waste that has now come from Japan and is, is there, it's landing on the shores of the West Coast. People over there, a lot of them are starting to get uh, devices to, to, to check themselves to see if they become nuclear. And they've got radiation inside their own body. And they're really worried about it because they know if I get that in me, I'm in trouble. The organs of my body are in great trouble. You know, it's interesting that we, people who uh, go to other countries that um, are very poor, you know, third world countries where they have no clean water and there's just, how many of you know when there's no clean water, there's every kind of sickness and disease. People are dying way early. Children, uh, you know, half the children or more are, die before they ever get to age five. It's, it's just an awful situation. And so... Um, the answer is, go and dig them a well. Because where are they drinking from? They're, tr they're drinking from any place that they can find water, but they don't understand. They know it's water, and they know that somehow this quenches my thirst, because it's thirst that drives you to drink, is it not? And so they're, they're, they're looking for something wet. And, th yeah, this looks like water, and, uh, and they don't know it's dirty. They don't know that it's contaminated. Um, and so, so they're drinking because it's meeting an immediate need for the moment. But what are they doing to their body? They're filling it full of enemies that are going to destroy them and kill them. And if they don't get extremely sick, I mean, if they don't die, they at least get extremely sick. So, so Somebody comes in and they dig a well where they're going after water deep in the ground and they pour it out and they give somebody a drink of that. Are they going to see a difference? Wow, that's, that's clear. There's nothing moving in that. And they begin to experience clean water. They start drinking that, and they start through that experience. Something happens inside of them where they just say, clean is good. See, before they didn't know what clean was. They just know, you know, we get sick, and sometimes they don't even connect that we get sick and die because of what we're drinking. But somebody comes along who knows the difference. Jesus came along, he knew the difference between clean water and polluted water. He knew the difference between a clean spirit and a clean body versus a contaminated spirit, a contaminated body. And here's the deal, is that you can be a believer, and just because you've been born again and you have become the righteousness of God doesn't mean that you still don't have the power to contaminate your own body, to pollute your own spirit. If that wasn't true, Paul wouldn't have said it, would he? I've actually, as I've taught this in past years in other places, and I've had people come up to me angry, say, that can't happen to me, I'm born again. And I said, I didn't say it. Paul said it. The Spirit of God said it through his word. I didn't say that. I had one, I actually had a pastor come up to me and he said, does it really say that? And I said, look, it's right here. Pollute, contaminate, defile. And he said, I never knew that. You know, and a lot of people don't want to spend time talking about negative things. Pollution is negative. You know, defilement is negative. Well, it is negative. But Paul's saying, you know what you got the grace for? To give you the power to not be there. But the ball's in our court. You see, we are the ones who need to look at ourselves and consider, am I drinking some clean stuff or am I 
drinking from the world's ponds. He says, come out from them and be separate. Do not touch that which is unclean. Paul, I mean, God said it in the Old Testament. You can find a number of places where the Lord said that in the Old Testament. But here Paul is bringing from the old into the new and saying, God has not changed his mind about this. The grace of God is actually so that you could fulfill this. But God is not going to make you separate yourself from the things that are his enemies. He's not going to force you or magically wave a wand over you. And some people, that's their definition of grace. It's this magical power through Jesus that comes over you, and suddenly you just kind of change. You look back over your shoulder and say, wow, look at what Jesus did. I've got new desires. I've got new... Well, yeah, he is working in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. But before he says that, he says, but work out your salvation with fear and trembling because God's working in you. See, the, the degree to which God can actually perfect you and, and make you a marvelous temple of the Spirit depends on how you respond to what he wants to do in you, how much you value it. And God is looking for people who look at themselves. They look at him, and then they look at themselves and say, whoa, something needs to change here. They look at Jesus, and then they look at the world, and they say, you know what? we got a problem. Contamination, pollution, defilement. So Paul says, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. Do not be yoked together. That word yoked means to take two different animals, totally different species, and put them in the same yoke and expect them to pull together in harmony. It's like putting a goat and a donkey in the same yoke and say, giddy up. And you already know what's going to happen. Not only are they going to do it differently, they can't even think the same. They have completely different instincts. But if you put two perfectly matched animals with the same strength and the same instincts, the same kind of response, you're going to go somewhere. And so it was a very clear picture that Paul brings in you know, because he knew that these people in an agrarian society would understand the yoking of animals. And he was saying that if you really want to go somewhere with God, don't try to put Jesus in one side and put the devil on the other. Don't put the Holy Spirit on one side and the desires of the world in the other. Don't put you in one side and another person who is not born again who doesn't have the spirit of God doesn't even have the capacity to think or desire like God see it takes God to love God if you're if you're trying to fulfill your life being connected with people who don't even have the capacity to go where you want to go. That you might agree politically, you might agree in, you know, in your family history, you might, you might agree with uh, all kinds of things and say, oh, you know, I, I, I love these uh, dating uh, and single websites, how to, how to find a mate, you know, and, and checking all the compatibility. But even the Christian ones, I just say, you know what? Until you've seen this person walk with God, you don't know what you're getting. They can profess Jesus all they want. But until you've watched them pull, until you've watched them walk the walk and love him the way you love him, you, you don't know what you're getting. Do not 
the une unequally yoked with, with unbelievers. And the, this is how he describes it. He calls it partnership. Join, which means join another in common goal or experiences. He, he said, don't be in fellowship. That word koinonia, that means to share and participate in what another one has. He said, what harmony do we have? That word harmony is actually the word we get the word symphony from. You know, it takes two, two instruments to create harmony, two voices to create harmony, playing together, following the same harmonic and, and um, do not he said what do we have in common that word means a piece of the whole like a piece of a pie what do you have sharing together you know you got to look at you got to look at somebody else's pie Do you have anything in common there? Agreement. What agreement do we have? Which means votes cast the same way. So this, this is what it means to be unequally yoked. We're yoked together with unbelievers. Is, is that there's all this participation and there's this agreement. There's this um, trying to get my life's needs met partnering with somebody else who doesn't have the greatest love that I have at the center of their heart. In fact, everything inside of them, whether they know it or not, is actually their agreement is with things that are hostile toward God. Now, it, doesn't, it isn't just about people. It's, it's, about, it's about the whole world. It's about, it's about the pursuits of the world. It's, it's, it's about what the world loves and what they're applauding, what they're, what they're chasing after, what they're entertaining themselves with, it, um, how they're spending their time, what they value the most. And um, we have to ask ourselves some very hard questions about our partnerships with different things the things that we try to have some commonality with, what we're giving ourselves over to. We, we have to look at my, how am I spending my time, energy, and resource and all of my relationships. Are those things provoking jealousy in God because the things that I am loving and, and coming to agreement with are actually opposed to him? And if you're in a yoke with somebody who doesn't want to go where you're going, you're going to be in a tug of war. You're going to find yourself either wanting to get out of the yoke or you're going to surrender to where they're pulling. It depends on what you want. Now, Paul says this is, this is how he describes the unbeliever. He says they're lawless. They're in darkness. He calls them Belial which is another Old Testament name for Satan, Satan himself. I, I don't know how to say this to you, but I'll just say it. There are things that we partner with in the world as Christians right now that is literally Satan himself. And we've got to get discerning about this. See, the thing about when you start drinking clean water, you start recognizing dirty water. You start drinking clean water, you start seeing those things that are swimming around in that other stuff. When you start drinking clean water, you actually start recognizing what it feels like to be healthy versus sick. And part of perfecting holiness in our lives is that we just are so about drinking clean. That we begin to recognize that which is polluted. 
I want to tell you that the Holy Spirit is getting ready to move through the church to clean us up, to get the pollution out, and to call us into something much higher, much greater. We're called to perfect, to complete holiness. We're called to be separate. I want to share two verses with you, and then we'll, then we'll close. First Peter chapter 2. I'm already feeling like I'm, I'm not really adequately teaching this the way I want to. But I'm, I'll just say we're breaking it open here today. 1 Peter chapter 2, starting with verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which war wage war against the soul. Now, interesting how he ties the two together. He said, God has made you to be a holy people, a holy nation, a people for himself, his own possession. And if you take any time to meditate on that and say, is that who I am? Is that what I get to be? You realize that he's taken you and he's set you apart from things. And you have to be willing to let him set you apart. You have to be willing for him to reach in and just say, this needs to go. This could be a problem to you. This could pollute and contaminate the possibility of who God has already made you to be in Christ. You know, it's, it's an interesting moment when we see that we have something in our life that potentially could hurt us and destroy us or is in competition with God, and we make the choice to take it and throw it away. Some things we burn. It was a part of my life, but now I'm recognizing the Spirit of God is saying, unclean. This is messing me up. I've got to be set apart from that. Because I've been set apart unto the Lord. And God will not have competition. He's not going to share a space with something else. Jesus said it this way, you cannot serve two masters. It's either God or it's mammon. But we deceive ourselves into thinking that we can't. And Jesus said it doesn't work. You're a holy nation. So I, Paul, or Peter says, I urge you as aliens and strangers. What is he saying? He's saying, you know what? Get a new view of yourself. You don't belong here. Your life does not come from this world. And if you're trying to be popular in this world and to be accepted and to, be, um, uh, to fit in because you value the people and the things of this world more than, than God himself and his heaven, you're going to have a problem. What you're going to find yourself, you're going to find yourself continually pulled into the lusts of the flesh because your flesh loves the world. And so he's saying you're going to have to start cutting things off. You're going to have to start abstaining. You're going to have to make some really hardcore decisions about some things. You let the Holy Spirit show you what is this costing me in terms of the fulfillment of God's promise in my life? How is this affecting my my grace package is my vessel empty or full where am i going with this
Titus 2. And then we'll wrap it up. I'm not teaching these things to make anybody feel bad. Otherwise, I'd feel really bad. <laughs> but I feel like God is just saying it's it's a it's a wake up time. It's readjustment time. It's reevaluation time. Titus chapter two. We'll start with verse eleven. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession zealous for good deeds. And this is what I've discovered, is that you read something like that, a people for his own possession, a pur purified people for his own possession, and that either awakens something in you that's very positive and makes you hungry, or you want to close the book and say, what's, I'm missing my favorite TV program, what's for lunch? But see, if the Spirit of God is really active in you, if you've really been born again, if the grace of God is on you, you read a passage like that, and, and something inside you goes, ah, a people for his own possession, and he wants to purify me. Of course he wants to purify me. He redeemed me from every lawless deed, and I'm guilty, and I've still got a lot of this stuff following me. I've got to be transformed. But either there's a desire in you to be his or not, to be fully his or not, <clears throat> to look like him or not. And that's, that's really what holiness is, is that this, you let the, the Holy Spirit, who is, is the spirit of holiness, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4. It's the spirit of holiness. That means he is, he is the spirit sent from God to dwell in you to change you into the likeness of God. To give you the desire for it and then give you the power to move toward that until it's complete. Perfecting holiness. But here's the last kicker, in the fear of the Lord. And a lot of people don't like that phrase either. They say, well, you know, it just means in awe of God. You know, we're, we're not supposed to be afraid of it. Everybody runs immediately. We're not supposed to be afraid of God. <coughs> you know what? There isn't a single verse in the New Testament that says you're not supposed to be afraid of God. Somebody made that up. They say, oh, well, his perfect love has cast out all fear. Well, yeah. I want to I walk in the knowledge of how much he loves me to the absolute max, and I'm not there yet. But his perfect love does cast that out there because I re realize how much he loves me. But see, the scripture says God is not mocked. He says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. And if we jump back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we see Paul talking about the fear of the Lord. And he says, knowing what it is to fear the Lord, we do this. And that verse follows him talking about, for we shall all appear before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account. You see, the fear of the Lord has a lot to do. It's more than just I'm in awe of God and he's just so immense that I, that I just couldn't help but just want him and do what, what he wants. No, it's, it's also the realization that there is, I, that I am accountable for everything I've received. This is part of the perfection of God. It's part of the holiness of God. Part of the justice of God is that he would actually require of us a, an accounting 
of what he gave us. Did Jesus say something about that in the parable of the talents and the, you know, and all of that? Yeah, boy, there's an accounting. The master's coming back. He gave you something. He's looking for something. So, well, that's not grace. Oh, yes, it is. It's the grace of God that he actually gave you the opportunity to be able to have God in you and do God things with your life. And if you just didn't value it and you despised it and you just said, nope, that means nothing to me because you love the world more, that's not God's problem. I urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain. I urge you, therefore, with these promises to look at yourself and start cleaning. Let the Spirit of God start cleaning. I'm not talking about pull out the rule book and check yourself. I'm not talking about letting other people judge you and tell you what's right and wrong. I'm talking about you getting with God and saying, I love you so much, and I want everything about you to be what's true about me. And, Lord, if there be any harmful way in me. Do you remember somebody praying that prayer in one of the Psalms? If they're, Lord, search me and know me. Try my heart and see. Because I can't see very well. But you can see perfectly and reveal to me, show me anything in me that's contradictory to you, that's blocking you in my life, that's going to separate me from my destiny, that's going to keep the, the fulfillment of, of, of Jesus in me from happening. Lord, reveal those things and show it to me. And I'm letting you know right now, as soon as you show it to me, I'm moving. If there's any, uh, in order for me to be more separated unto you, I've got to get separated from some more things. Lord, if there's anything I'm touching that I shouldn't be touching, I'm cleaning it out. I'm cutting that off out of my life. I'm not going there anymore. If there's anybody I'm with, if there's any, is anybody that I'm trying to find life with, anybody I'm partnering with where I, I'm deceiving myself and thinking this relationship is going to really make me happen and it's becoming a substitute for you. And by the way, Lord, they're, they're probably going in the opposite direction anyway. I'm just going gonna, gonna to rearrange that relationship. Whatever it takes to stop the yoking together. Because he has said, come out from among them and be separate. <sighs> and someday I'm going to give an account for what, I, what I've received. That's another whole message. You're going to really like it when I bring it. Did you know we're headed there? Next stop. You know, we just say, oh, I'm, I'm going to heaven when I die. Of course you are. It's just there's a little stop along the way. <laughs> Judgment seat of Christ. Because God would not be perfect. He would not be holy. He didn't require an accounting. And... Um, And that might just give you a healthy reevaluation of what you're doing with your life. Lord, should I, should I be doing that? Should I be with this person? Should I give myself to this? Should I be watching that TV program? Should I, you know, should I, should I, should I? And, and you know what? If you're listening to the Holy Spirit, you might hear him say, no. And if you say, well, Lord, what's wrong with that? You're already asking the wrong question. Because what you're trying to do is say, I want to get away with as much as I can. And the question we should be asking is, what's right with that? What is like Jesus about that? What is this producing in my life that, that looks like him, that fulfills his desire? Is he pleased with that or is he jealous? What's it really doing with my heart? Am I contaminating myself? That's such a big word. You know, part of the fear of the Lord is realizing I can contaminate, pollute, defile this temple. 
You ever, have you ever felt that before? You realize, God, it just defiled what you made holy. I'm glad he's given us repentance and confession. and We can get things fixed right away. But I'm t saying to you, this is a call on your life for the rest of your life. It doesn't happen in one moment. This is an orientation towards the promises of the Father. Having these promises, let us. And this, it just never stops. You continually live in this place. It's a, it's, it's a discipline that you develop in your own heart because you so value God. You so value that you have such regard for who he made you to be. And you realize nothing else matters. And so you just keep perfecting holiness. You can't do it all in one time anyway. If God showed you everything at one time, you'd come apart. But we stay in that place. We just say, Lord, show me. Lord, I'm ready. I just want to be clean. And be holy as you are holy. I want you to dwell in me, unhindered. Show me. And he will. You can get to the place where you become so sensitive to the Holy Spirit that before you're about to say a word, the Spirit will say, don't say that. As you're getting ready to, to click on something on your computer and the, and the Spirit will say, you don't want to go there. And if you go there, the moment you click, you're telling the Lord, there's something else I want more than you. And that should be a wake-up call to you right there. You should immediately go, oh, God, there's something I want more than you. Why, do I, why am I thinking that way? Why am I acting that way? Why would I think there's something better than you? Because, see, he's really looking for our obedience. And uh, you can be sitting and talking with somebody that you, 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 you've been hanging out with them and they've been friends and, and uh, suddenly you're reading something that they posted on Facebook and, and suddenly there's this conviction by the Spirit that this isn't good. I think I need to adjust something. I'm letting this person influence me, take me somewhere I shouldn't be. I guarantee you that the more you clean, the more sensitive you become to the unclean. And one of the biggest problems we have in the church in America right now is we are so polluted and so defiled that we can't even recognize the filth that we're partnering with right now and calling it ministry to Jesus and grace. We, do, we don't even know. And we offer that polluted water to one another and say, hey, this is prophetic. Or whatever we call it. So I'm telling you that God is getting ready to come as a purifying, refining fire through his church, and we are not going to look the same as we do right now. It's not going to be about rules. It's not about us all becoming uptight prudes. You know, everybody's got so much fear about when you start talking about fixing things. There's nothing to be afraid of. The Spirit of God is leading us. He'll let us know exactly what he wants. The question is, do we want to go with him? And I think you'll be amazed at where he takes you if you really surrender that. Do we have the fear of the Lord? Do we have such regard for him? Do we want him more than anything? This is what I felt the Lord showed me 
um, last week, and that is that um, the spirit of holiness, I, I, you've, you've heard what I've said, and you can walk out of here thinking whatever and making whatever decisions and so forth. But there, there is a spirit of holiness. And I, and I felt like the Lord said there's, there's an impartation for this. And so um, um, I felt like the Lord told me that I'm supposed to lay hands on you. If you feel like the Lord is, is really talking to you about moving this direction, then this may not be for everybody in the room at all. But if you feel like the Lord is saying, you're, you're realizing, I need to move into perfecting holiness and the fear of the Lord. I need, I need God to jumpstart this thing in my life. Um, I, want, I want to lay hands on you. I'm going to ask John to come down. And uh, I was hoping Mar Margie was going to get to be here. Is she here? She didn't make it. Okay. Um, I was going to have John and Eunice come and join me. But um, we just want to have you come down. We just, we just want to simply lay hands on you and just release an impartation of the, the activation of the spirit of holiness in your life. Simple, but it's just you, it's just a point of contact for your agreement to have God begin to do something. And, and John, maybe you can just put something on up there. And, and um, um, <laughs> all right, and then and then we're done.